Okay, so let's get going. Why don't you go ahead and start recording and uh, and we'll uh, we'll get started. So welcome everyone once again on behalf of the uh, Brainerd Lakes Chamber of Commerce and Brainerd Dispatch. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for taking the time to be here uh, this afternoon. My name is Matt Killian. I'm the president of the Brainerd Lakes Chamber. Uh, very proud to serve as your host and moderator today. Uh, I'd say it's an understatement to say that this has been a difficult time for all of us. I uh, hope everyone is uh, well, happy, and as healthy as, as possible in every possible way. Uh, you know, we have a community leadership meeting every Wednesday morning, and we thought it would be very important and beneficial uh, for people to hear directly uh, from our local healthcare providers who are on the ground uh, level every day preparing testing for and treating this virus. So I do wanna say thank you uh, to uh, Cuyuna Regional Medical Center, to Essentia Health, uh, and to Lakewood Health System for their work, their heroic work, uh, and taking time out of their busy days to join us. I know you're all muted, but uh, if you can give them the thumbs up or some silent round of applause, I, I think they'd really appreciate that. Um, they're doing a great job for the Brainerd Lakes area. You know, we've all been following the local, state, and national news, and we've heard all the COVID-19 updates. I have to say, our Brainerd Dispatch, in particular, has done a, an outstanding job uh, covering the local news as one of our most essential businesses. And before we get started, uh, I'd like to hand it over to my friend and, and the publisher of the uh, Brainerd Dispatch, Mr. Pete Mose, uh, to say a few words. So, Pete? Thanks for being thanks, here. Thanks for those presenting. kind words, Matt. I appreciate it. Thanks to the Chamber for sponsoring this event today. And we're proud to, as a dispatch to be a co-sponsor as local coverage of COVID-19 has been a top priority for the dispatch. Since early March, our dispatch and Echo Journal reporters have put together almost 200 byline stories on how the pandemic affects our lakes area. Many of our stories are connected to health concerns. And today's webinar provides an opportunity to ask questions of the medical leaders from our area. Thanks again to the chamber and thank you to all the healthcare workers in our area. Thank you. All right, Pete, thank you again for partnering on this, uh, on this event. You know, we've had a number of webinars. This is the largest we've had by far. I'm looking at a couple hundred participants, I believe that have joined us, joined us today. We're, we're going to keep everyone muted and that's just to preserve the sound quality. Uh, so if you try to unmute yourself, uh, or you don't know how this stuff works, you're gonna find that we're, we're just gonna keep you muted here for the next hour. I wanna thanks, uh, say thank you, excuse me, to everybody who submitted uh, questions in advance. We've essentially crafted today's entire agenda around your questions. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our three healthcare leaders uh, in the Brainerd Lakes area who will be speaking today. And uh, if you could uh, help me welcome Kyle Bauer, uh, the CEO of Cuyuna Regional Medical Center. Tim Rice is the president and CEO of Lakewood Health System. And Dr. Pete Henry is the chief medical officer of Essentia Health. So welcome gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having us. Thank you. And Dr. Henry, I heard through the grapevine that today's a special day for you, is that true? Actually, it was yesterday. It was my oh, it was birthday. yesterday. Okay. Well, thank happy you. birthday. We I won't reveal that. your age. Yeah. All right, happy thank you. Um, okay, so let's get right into it uh, with some opening comments. Uh, just to set the stage, as of today, Crowing County has at least 20 confirmed cases and one very tragic death so far. I know that uh, we're not one of the hot spots, thank goodness, in the in the state right now but you've been preparing and dealing with this pandemic around the clock for the past uh, month or more. So let's start with some opening comments from each of you. We reserved two minutes for this for each of the uh, three leaders that we have. And Tim Rice, can I start with you? Very good. Just wanna thank uh, Matt and Pete for the opportunity to be on the webinar today. Um, Matt, like you said, for all of our health organizations, just not ours, you know, we've been really uh, working around the clock really since March about trying to be prepared uh, for, for this COVID uh, pandemic. 
Uh, I think one of the things that's important is we really feel that um, that we're prepared, and I, I'm just really proud of Central Minnesota and how the healthcare organizations in this area work together, and really being proactive even before some of the mandates come about. But I think that just represents the healthcare from this area. Um, I think the other part is we're really so fortunate uh, in Central Minnesota. We really have uh, really committed and compassionate healthcare workers and providers. Um, they have no doubt about that we're doing the right thing. And regardless of all the changes are going through and impact they're experiencing, when we're all out there with in our organizations, we just see from them stating, you know, we're doing what's important, we're doing what's right. And that's what's uh, enjoyable for us as leaders is to be able to work with such wonderful people. Maybe the only thing I want to conclude with is, is that um, I've been in healthcare administration for uh, 46 years uh, compared to these young guys that are also on the panel today. So I'm definitely the, uh, the much older one. But, you know, here I've been at this 46 years and I've never experienced anything like it uh, during that time. So uh, maybe I just want to conclude there's just no roadmap for this. Uh, that all of us are just working hard to do the very best we can uh, to meet the health needs of our area. And if you take a look at all three of our organization, that just fits the mission that we've all had, is focusing on why we're here and to do the right thing. So just thanks for allowing me to be uh, here today on the webinar. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Tim. Kyle, can we uh, transition over to you? Kyle sure. from Cuyuna Regional Medical Center. You bet. And I just want to tag on to Tim's comment to thank um, both you, Matt, and the Chamber for putting on this community webinar. Um, hopefully it gives an opportunity to hear directly from the healthcare institutions um, about our outlook on where we are with uh, COVID. Um, we started uh, our incident command planning um, in March and uh, we're still at it. Uh, we've gotten most of our planning done and just a few tweaks here and there, um, but getting prepared for kind of what we're seeing today and then potentially what uh, a potential surge in patients would look like in the future. And uh, it's been very enjoyable working throughout the region. Um, all three of our hospitals, along with other hospitals, have been communicating on a weekly basis, sharing best practices, bouncing ideas off each other, and it's, it's been a very cooperative relationship. So. Uh, again, thank you for uh, allowing us to, to do this webinar. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Dr. Henry. Thanks, and I don't want to be too repetitive of what Kyle and Tim have said, but I, I do thank the community for the participation that we've had in helping us to prepare for this and also the businesses that have been partners in helping our organization and their organizations prepare for this. I think it truly has been a great collaboration. I think we're fortunate to live in the state of Minnesota that has uh, for many, many years led uh, public health and the initiatives around public health. And I think it's been uh, positioned as well to be prepared for this upcoming ep uh, epidemic or pandemic that will peak uh, later this uh, spring or summer. So at, at this point, I, I feel also fortunate to be part of a large health system that has uh, many resources available to it, including data scientists, research scientists that have helped us to bring uh, top level care right here to our local communities. And as uh, Kyle had talked about, we're participating with the rural or the central health care coalition to the Minnesota Department of Emergency Preparedness and Public Health. And we have all been collaborating together to hopefully bring uh, great care here to the area and continue to have the care that we've had for non-COVID related illness, but also COVID related illness. And I believe that this information and getting it out to people and the transparency goes with that, that information is knowledge and we hope to impart some of that today. So thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, Dr. Henry, you mentioned uh, th this concept of the surge uh, or the peak and that's probably what's on everyone's mind right now, when we might see surge or peak cases in our local area. Um, when we sent out the, the survey asking for people to ask it, questions in advance, that was the, the, probably the most frequently asked question that we had. And I'll give you two examples. Sam Cavalier from Breezy Point, when do you predict Crow Wing and Cass County might see this peak? 
Nikki Bjornstad from Crosby is wondering about the availability of ICU beds and some of the pre preparedness around that. Uh, so I guess the question is, when are you predicting or planning for a peak or surge? And how are you preparing for that? And I would just uh, invite anyone to uh, jump in. So, so I can start out with the, uh, the prediction for this is like most other predictive models, the further you get out, the less accurate they become. So you can get pretty good numbers with the variables that you put into that particular model that will tell you what will happen relatively close to accuracy in the first few weeks. You get out several months, the, then things change significantly. Uh, we, we're fortunate then in the state of Minnesota, there's collaboration with all the major health systems and the other health systems the, in the state, along with the Minnesota Department of Health and Governor's Office, that we're using what's called the Minnesota Hospital Association model for predictions of this. And there's data that goes into that. And one of the key data is, is the doubling time, or how long does it take for the number of cases to double? And with the uh, governor's order to uh, stay at home, we've seen that number continue to increase. That also then flattens, as many people have heard, flattens the curve. So based on the data that we have today and a doubling time of around 16 days, we don't anticipate the, the peak to be here until sometime in probably early to mid-August. But there are many factors that can change that. For example, we uh, know that uh, tourism is a lifeblood of our economy here in this area. And when you see a lot of people migrating from the Twin Cities area, returning from the Southern United States, some of those factors can make a, a significant difference. But there are a number of variables that go into these analytic mod models, and we watch them very closely, uh, recognizing that uh, they kind of tell you direction. They're not always real accurate when you got months out, but the current data we have right now looks like sometime in early to mid-August for the peak. Okay, thank you. Kyle or Tim, would you, would you mind uh... Uh, adding anything to that, would you like to? I think from our standpoint, our data is, is showing very much the same as uh, Dr. Henry's. And again, preparing for um, mid to late summer where we might see a peak in this area. But again, there's so many variables that go into that that um, we're prepared now if the peak happens next week, so. Yeah, I have to agree. We're prepared now. Um, we try to take a look at, we're also looking at uh, August. We're just trying to look at in our planning, you know, as even from financially, what are probably the, the worst case scenarios. So it's better for us to project it out later. But I think as Kyle said too, we're prepared and we're prepared now. But so we're just making sure we have the appropriate equipment and the more time we have working with other facilities and coordinating how that process could work. Um, so it is giving us time to get ready, uh, you know, for whatever may occur, sharing of resources uh, and equipment and use of facilities. So, but um, yeah, August is definitely a projection we're using. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we'll get into uh, uh, preparedness on several of these questions. I'd like to pivot over to testing. And uh, testing's really been at the center of all of the safety discussions, the status of testing, how it works, the, certainly the availability of testing and what happens when someone tests positive. I know the governor was saying that his moonshot was 20,000 tests per day. He's been working with Minnesota companies, the Mayo Clinic to hit that goal. And of course we have lots of participant questions around this. I'll give you three examples here. Craig Forsgren from Pillager, he's asking about symptoms and what should trigger a, a, a call for help or testing? What symptoms would there be? Renee Milner from Cross Lake, should we be testing everyone for COVID if they haven't had any symptoms? And then uh, Eric Logie uh, from Pine River, what's the treatment for patients with the virus? So it, it, there's a lot here around testing and I, I'd like to just to open it up for you to address some of those issues. I know Dr. Henry, you wanted to start on this question too. So let's let's start with you and then we'll we'll move down the line. So there have been a lot of things that have happened around the testing. So initially the testing was very limited and was done through the Minnesota Department of Public Health. And the turnaround time could be as long as five to seven days. We've come a long ways from there now where many facilities, including ours and I believe the others that are on the call, 
currently have in-house testing capabilities. Uh, those are called the more rapid tests. And, it's, and there's uh, also a lot of misinformation about there as to the accuracy. And we feel that the testing platforms that we're using uh, present the highest specific specificity and sensitivity or accuracy around these tests. So at this point in time, we still have the ability to send tests out. They go to the Mayo Clinic system, and we have a very high volume of those. Those Most of those are coming from our drive-through testing facility, but we have in-house testing on several of our different platforms that we use that does uh, rapid testing as well. We have also uh, instituted serology testing, and there's been a lot in the news about that, and we can talk a little bit more uh, as times go, as we go further on in this talk, but the serology testing has a very limited use, uh, usefulness and there were very specific criteria. And the only caution I would ask uh, people to use in the community is to look to replicable healthcare systems, such as the three of us, to get that type of testing because there's a lot of uh, test kits that have very low sensitivity or accuracy that uh, are being put out there on the market and people are utilizing them and they really do not unless they're used in the right patients at the right time in the illness and have a very good process uh, to be performed by can give you misinformation that will not really help you in guiding how to treat, who to treat, et cetera. So I, I, I think we have the full capability here in, the, in our area. We have expanded it and it will continue to expand per the governor's request. We are participating in the uh, what's called the test testing coordination center through the Minnesota Department of Health and the governor. And we have representatives that sit on that committee to help to deal with some of the issues around testing, not only the kits, but the viral transport media that is used, the swabs that are used to help make sure that everyone who needs a test that is symptomatic at this point in time. And there are other prioritized people that are not symptomatic, but at this point, we're not testing all asymptomatic patients but hopefully that would be the ideal state so that you'd know the true prevalence of the disease in the community. And I think that's what the governor wants to see is to get to that 20,000 tests a day capability so you can test both symptomatic and asymptomatic as well as, well as some of the critical or essential workers, long-term care facilities, et cetera. Well, yeah, thank you for that. I'll, I'll invite our, our other two to, to jump on here and Maybe the questions would be, you know, do, do we have enough tests? That's, that's one of the questions that we keep getting. Um, who do you test and what do you have to be presenting as far as symptoms to get a test? Well, go ahead, Tim. At, at Lakewood, we've, um, we're only doing patients who are um, symptomatic at, at this point. So um, we're just being careful on the resources uh, on our testing. Uh, I did check this morning. Uh, we've done 300 tests, uh, and to date we've had 11 positive. Uh, at, and I think each of our situations are different. On all of ours, we've had no hospitalizations uh, from those. Uh, so right now, with how we're doing it, we do feel that we have enough testing material. Uh, but again, we're being very careful on how we're using it uh, at this point. Um, we do do um, some curbside testing, and I think it depends on the patient themselves. You know, if they're feeling cautious and, and that they do an e-visit, but they have a preference that they don't want to come in the facility, we try to be, well, we are. We are accommodating to the specific needs of those patients, but that's a level of activity that we've been having so far. Thank you. Kyle, anything to add there? From uh, our standpoint, we're doing the same thing that uh, Tim's doing. We're following MDH and CDC guidance on uh, testing people with symptoms. Um, people who do test positive, we, uh, we've had a couple of hospitalizations, um, but more often the, the patient is recovering at home and they're put on a watch list and we have um, nurses and other healthcare workers that follow up with them daily just to monitor their symptoms um, to make sure that uh, their health is improving or not getting worse. And if it is getting worse, then we make sure we get them into the hospital um, before we'd be in a crisis situation. Yeah, I, I, think, I think as Tim and Kyle have talked about that the Minnesota Department of Health has put out fairly uh, straightforward guidelines as to who they uh, will allow us to test. And as part of this testing coordination center, we're gonna be required to uh, try to follow that. 
we're, we're fortunate at Essentia that we have in-house testing capabilities that do the rapid, but the, the key people are being tested at just anyone who has symptoms consistent with COVID-19, people that are living in long-term care facilities uh, when we're in a hospital and they're returning back into, into a congregate living facility such as a assisted living group home, long-term care facility, uh, a jail facility, they, they are prioritized for testing. Uh, family members who are symptomatic uh, and uh, they have a health care worker or critical care worker within their household and then contact tracing to the Minnesota Department of Public Health and our county public health are the ones that are cur currently prioritized. As time goes on and as test kits become available, and I think we're going to see a significant ramp up in that very quickly, we will be able to get to the point where we can test asymptomatic patients. Uh, some of the more uh, the other testing that's being performed is that we are not doing any elective surgeries per the governor's executive order, but there are testing, there are surgeries that are either urgent, emergent, or time sensitive, and that's another population that's uh, prioritized for testing as well prior to having their surgeries. Before I move on to the the next question, I think I think one of the things that people would like to know is that. Um, you know, if if you or one of your family members test positive, what is the treatment that's typically given? Uh, what does that process look like? I, I can start with that. So if you have a positive test, we notify every individual uh, that has a positive test in the ambulatory or outpatient setting of that positive test. And in general, this, the, the treatment is really symptomatic. There aren't good treatments known to be in the outpatient setting for treating the, this illness. As the great majority, 80% of them will be relatively mild or even minimally symptomatic and do not uh, require in, inpatient treatment such as oxygen and some of the other experimental or extended use drugs that are being um, used for this. So really we ask them to isolate and to do the, the appropriate distancing for that full 14 days from the day of illness. Uh, supportive treatment with Tylenol. There was a question as to whether or not some of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories such as Advil and Naproxen could be used, but uh, that data now is showing that that probably is safe as well. Obviously, maintaining good hydration is very important, getting plenty of rest as well. And then uh, there are opportunities because we notify everyone that is positive and uh, and Kyle alluded that his system, and I think Tim's is as well. We contact these individuals on a regular basis once they have a positive test. And we're also implementing an Essentia and the ability to have them actually use an app on their phone that in, in, uh, connects with our Epic electronic health record and they can actually tell us how they're feeling each day. It's through an app. And then eventually we hope to have home monitoring capabilities as well in the very near future so that we can follow these people not only that never show up in the hospital, hopefully keep them out of the hospital. And if they are in our hospital, we can follow them up closely thereafter. But every positive test, I believe, is notified by all three of our health systems. Right. Yeah, thank you. Well, let's let's transition for, from, uh, from, excuse me, testing to an acronym that we've all grown to, to know and become familiar with in the last month or so, and that's PPE, Personal uh, Protective Equipment. And so what we're talking about, of course, is like the masks and face shields and gloves and things of that nature. Um, maybe this question is also about the medical devices, the life-saving devices like ventilators and even ICU beds themselves. Um, I'm really proud of our local business community and many generous people that they've done a great job of manufacturing uh, and engineering this equipment locally, uh, all the way from, from masks and shields to hand sanitizer. And I think that's very unique to this community. But um, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe uh, quote a question here from Laura Bai from Merrifield. What's your advice on managing PPE or finding PPE? Are you dealing with shortages? Um, so just uh, some general comments on the PPE equipment and you know the local availability. Whoever would like to take that one. I, I, I can start again if you'd like. Um, we kind of broken this into the three things that we're talking about here, the space, what is the bed availability, and as the, the others have talked about, we feel that we have the appropriate bed availability, and as we kind of go through our conventional and contingency and crisis stages, most of us are using those kind of three classification conventionals, what's our usual bed status and, and capability. 
Uh, contingency is what we do as we start to see the surge and require more medical surgical beds, more ICUs, and more ventilators, and then the crisis and where there would be potential of necessity of uh, actually taking care of people outside of uh, what we would consider a normal hospital setting or a facility. And so we, we break it into uh, space, which is the bed availability staff. Can you have the staff to take care of them? Because you can have all the beds you need, but unless you have the appropriate amount of nurses, intensive care specialists, uh, physicians, APPs to care for those people, it's gonna be hard to meet those demands. And we feel that we're putting into planning as are the other organizations to meet those needs and feel in a good place in, in that as concerned, because we overlap the predictive modeling with what our, we call our uh, surge capacity. And we make sure that they match to say, at this date and time, we expect to have this many patients in our hospitals, this many patients in our medical surgical beds, and this many patients in an ICU on a ventilator. We know that we have the staffing to do that. And then there's the stuff, and that's the ventilators, the medications, all the equipment that goes with the ventilators, including the uh, filters, the HEPA filters that go with that, and then the appropriate staff that knows how to use, utilize those ventilators. Uh, we also have, and I'm sure other health systems are utilizing this, the capability to do tele-ICU, both for our nurses and our physicians. And so we have the expertise right here. We have uh, intensivist pulmonologist specialist, Dr. Davis, who's kind of leading that effort in our hospital, along with our hospitalists and our ED providers. And we have the capability of reaching out to our level one trauma hospital in the east for additional staffing and uh, help with care of those patients that are more critically ill so that they can be cared for with the same kind of standard of care you'd get in a large metropolitan area and the same expertise as well. And you can do it right here at close to home. Uh, so we feel like we're in a good place. As far as the PPE is concerned, uh, uh, we had experienced some questionable shortages early, but we have done a huge campaign on reuse and uh, repurposing of some of this PPE. We know that if a mask uh, that is uh, the type that can be reused, if you set it aside for five days, that the virus is no longer there and you can reuse that. We also are treating our masks with ultraviolet light technology to help uh, extend the life of those. And 3M, which is the primary manufacturer of the N95, uh, now has a protocol along with the Xenix, which is the UV light technology. It's one of the companies that you can uh, you can reuse those masks and retreat them up to 10 times without affecting their their safety or filtering capabilities. So we've become in a, in a much better capacity at this point in time. And then one other quick thing, we've contracted with local businesses who have repurposed some of their manufacturing capabilities to help us make face shields and other equipment to protect our staff and patients. And lastly, I'd like to thank Cuyahoga Regional Medical Center uh, for uh, collaborating us on a campaign that was called Fishing for Masks to try to get an, a more cloth mask so that we can give those to all of our patients and visitors uh, that come into our facilities. So thank you. Thank you. And Kyle from CRMC or Tim from Lakewood, uh, your thoughts on, on PPE availability and how you're managing that. Well, I think when we, we started, there was some concern um, about the availability of PPE. Uh, part of that had to do with uh, China manufactures 50% of the world's PPE and their big manufacturing hub was right in Wuhan, China. And that factory was actually shut down for, I think, six weeks. Um, but given the good social distancing that we've done in the state, we've been able to acquire um, additional PPE, not solely through our primary vendors, but we've also uh, sourced uh, PPE through uh, secondary vendors. As far as surge capacity, um, as part of our planning, um, we can double our ICU capacity in a relatively short period of time. Typically, we, we operate uh, under 25 uh, beds as our typical operating structure, but we've looked internally at uh, places like our post-op surgery area. Uh, we could flex up to 80 beds if, if we needed to. So um, from a surge standpoint, I think the region, we're in, we're in pretty good shape there. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the PPE is in much better shape today than it was even a month ago. Mm -hmm. Tim, your thoughts? Yeah, for, for Lakewood, uh, similar to um, when we first started out, uh, access to PPE was a challenge, but I think all of us are fortunate. Our procurement officers, purchasing people, they're just tremendous and they've just done uh, amazing things. And I know uh, Melanie from our organization here, she's just been fabulous for what, what she's done. Um, so I think right now we're doing okay. 
uh, in that area regarding, as they call it, all the stuff for the PPE. I, I guess regards to bed size and reconfiguring, you know, again, we're a critical access of 25 beds. We've identified with our space, we could surge up to 66 beds. I think the other element for us is, is that we also have assisted living, senior housing, and a care center. And when we built our new facility out here, we did keep, uh, uh, we had our old hospital attached to our care center. So with this transition, we've converted uh, the uh, old hospital, those beds into a COVID center. So for example, if we have individuals who are transferred to our care center, they actually go into that COVID center first to, for a specific period of time so that before they go into the mainstream care center. So I think that's a lot of things that we're doing, we're utilizing our existing space just to make sure we're transitioning patients to make sure that we're keeping everybody safe. Uh, we also got, I call them the uh, robotic units that are helping us sanitize equipment, rooms, uh, getting into that reuse. Um, and thank, thankful to the community for all the, you know, the mask and everything. So our employees do have access to uh, PPE throughout the system. And, uh, and another good example, collaboration, uh, Sourcewell uh, provided us the opportunity to get 3D printers to make uh, shields. And so again, that kind of collaboration in the community has really helped us um, with our uh, availability of our PPE uh, in our organization. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just again, just transitioning to the next topic, uh, you know, over the past month, month and a half, there's so many people, and not only locally, but across the state that have postponed the quote unquote elective surgeries. And I know you, you, you probably like that word as much as we like essential businesses as a, as a, a, a phrase. But um, these are elective surgeries that you know, people need and they're postponing them, um, other procedures, even in some cases, medical care. Um, I just have three question examples here to give you a sense on what our participants are wondering about. Randy Aldis from Pillager uh, is asking what uh, you see as the risk level for visiting a clinic or hospital. Uh, how long should people put these things off? Uh, Larry Middleton from Brainerd, how soon will non-essential procedures start being done? And then another one, Dave Bostrom from Baxter, uh, are your facilities preparing to open up uh, these elective services? And he's wondering about a backlog. And Kyle, I know you have perspectives on this. Can we start with you? Sure. Um, you know, we're, we're still here. We're, we're continuing to provide the care that uh, our communities need. Uh, we've transitioned um, a number of visits into um, telehealth, either via telephone um, or some type of video conferencing. And so uh, we're about half and half, but we do understand that some patients still need to come uh, to the facility or to the clinic um, and have a face-to-face -face visit with their provider. And we've taken many steps to ensure that if you do have to come uh, on site, that uh, we have the safest environment as possible. So we screen all employees, all patients at the door, which includes taking their temperature. We've in instituted universal masking at our campuses. And as far as surgery right now, we're um, still doing surgery, uh, mainly emergent or urgent surgery. And that basically means that if we don't do the surgery and there's a risk of you having a permanent disability, we do the surgery. And on the um, elective surgeries, we're following the governor's guidance, um, but we are making plans to uh, hopefully expand that service and then some additional services. And then I think a message I'd like to get out to the community is if you are having an acute medical episode, please do not hesitate to come to the hospital. We've seen uh, polling data nationwide that about a third of Americans um, are postponing um, urgent medical needs, and that can have some serious and life-threatening um, consequences. Uh, I know anecdotally, we've had patients who've come in with a burst appendix because they had a, a abdominal pain, but they were holding off. And um, we've also had patients who uh, may be in congestive heart failure who, who've put off uh, coming in, and then when they actually do arrive, they're, they're in, in pretty tough shape. So again, if you are having an acute medical uh, episode, 
uh, do not hesitate, please come in. And I think we've put in um, as many protocols as we can to ensure your safety. That's great. Dr. Henry or Tim, uh, anything to add around uh, elective surgeries or those types of uh, uh, healthcare access and procedures that people should know? So I, I would just say that I would echo uh, Kyle that we are performing surgeries as well and are open for business. Um, we, uh, like Kyle and Tim, are following the governor's executive order, which is still in place. And we cannot go beyond that. If we do, we run the risk of not having PPE from the st uh, strategic national stockpile moving away from that. But more importantly, we want to make sure that our patients are safe. And as uh, Kyle had talked about, we've instituted uh, screening for every staff, every visitor. We have uh, visitor restriction policies. We have new cleaning protocols above and beyond what were already excellent to ensure the safety. And as Kyle said, many people are delaying or foregoing uh, urgent and emergent care with the fear that they're going to contract the virus coming into our facilities. And I would tell you that the, the safety of coming in is excellent. Uh, the risk of not doing something when you have an urgent or emergent care is, uh, can be devastating. So we want people to know that we're all open for business, that they're going to be safe coming into our facility. The other thing is that there are as Kyle said, uh, the ability to do virtual visits at Essential Health, we've done 72,000 virtual visits now. The majority of those are video visits. And so you can always do a virtual visit, start with a telephone or a telephonic visit, and that can be escalated to an in-person face-to-face visit if necessary. And those can be coordinated in such a way that we've uh, worked our templates for our physicians and APPs to minimize the number of people in the facility at any one time. We've uh, re reformatted our waiting rooms. Uh, we have protocols in place for cleaning every, in between every patient that we will ensure their safety when they come in to get care at any of our facilities. Thank you. Tim, your thoughts? I don't think there's much more I can add to that from the standpoint that um, uh, it, it is safe for us to come here. We are open. Uh, we're doing all the things that are important as far as screening our employees, masking, practicing social distancing. We're uh, having as many employees as possible work from home. Uh, like the others, we've set up, uh, you know, our e-visits, our telehealth visits, um, you know, curbside, uh, lab work, those kind of things, and setting up our facilities. We have well entrances and entrances if there's respiratory uh, concerns. So we have different separation of entrances and cleaning. Yeah, very similar things, but uh, those are all things that we all have in place. But it, I think the biggest thing is, is just talking to the physicians and, and the staff and hearing their concerns about patients because of things that are time sensitive of not being cared for and their concern for their patients is a big issue for them. So just like the other said, just please encourage um, you to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and that you're coming in and getting that we can help provide a care for you uh, at this time. But having patients be in situations that they could be uh, further harmed by not coming in is a big concern for all of us. Does anybody want to uh, jump in and, and uh, let us know if you, if you have any insight as to when you'd be able to perform the elective surgeries at this point or is that permanent? This is this has been uh, something that our CEO Dave Herman for all of Essentia has been uh, talking to the governor and the Minnesota Department of Health on on a regular basis. Uh, we would anticipate that we would hope to see something within a week's time to at least give further direction on this, but uh, there's no guarantees on that. As uh, Kyle said and Tim said, we are all prepared to open up and resume business as usual with new practices and protocols in place to ensure patient safety. So we, we are all uh, wishing that we would see that change. Uh, Wisconsin and North Dakota have moved in that direction at this point in time. We anticipate the state of Minnesota will hopefully follow. Um, but uh, it, you know, it is, it is at this point in time, the, the executive order is in place. And I uh, share the concerns the person talks about these procedures kind of stacking up. We're already kind of into our recovery phase part of this, even though we haven't seen the surge, we start to plan to say, what do we do when we can start to get this backlog of patients related to mammograms, colonoscopies, and other things that are, may not be exactly in the near future 
time sensitive, but if you delay them too long, then you start to uh, run the risk of uh, cancers that go undetected, et cetera. So I think we're all preparing in the same manner in that, in that degree and anxiously awaiting the governor's word to be able to resume elective procedures. So let me preface uh, this next question by saying that we have an awesome set of communities here in the Brainerd Lakes area. I know you all believe that as well as everybody on the call here. And our communities have really come together to support um, not only healthcare professionals, but teachers and first responders and grocery store workers and just everybody on the front lines. Um, this question is about the support you've received, and I know you, you've all mentioned this, uh, the way that uh, people have really reached out to you. Uh, Roxanne from Merrifield is asking, what can we do as local residents to help the medical personnel? Uh, Karen from Brainerd, what do you feel is needed most in regards to the pandemic right now? Uh, so just a, a general question about community support. Um, what, what do you appreciate? Uh, what do you need right now, Tim? I think um, we did mention already just the uh, all of the, the work being done for making a fast. Uh, people just coming uh, out of you know really nowhere, and here they they themselves have had PP equipment, and they're willing to share that back. Uh, we've had businesses, you know, with cash donations uh, and just personal. You know, thank yous. Um, I, I share the story that I think every one of the facilities could share. But we had a, uh, a gentleman come into the clinic and share with a, um, <clears throat> a staff in the clinic stating, you do realize, he said, this is a war and you're all the front lines. I just want you to know that I just appreciate you so much for being on the front lines. And to me, you're the heroes. And I thought those are the kind of things that really make a difference is knowing that uh, our staff are supported. It's kind of interesting. You talk to the staff, well, what's your definition of a hero? And they're stating, well, just doing my job. And regardless of whether I know that person or not, I just want to do the best job I can every day. So I, I think that's that important is just uh, showing the appreciation uh, for our staff uh, and then I think the other part is, is, you know, as far as what we can do is how do we all take care of each other uh, out there? You know, I know that our own mental health well-being and support uh, is really critical. But, but we do appreciate just all the support and, and feedback that we're getting uh, for our staff and our employees. Yeah, thank you. Kyle or Dr. Henry, anything to add uh, regarding community support? Yeah, I would just take on to what Tim said. The response from the community has been nothing short of tremendous, um, whether that's uh, sewing masks or um, having some of our manufacturing um, shift their gears and, and uh, make equipment for us. Uh, we've had local restaurants uh, come and deliver staff or food for our staff. And I think as far as what uh, additionally things the community can do, I, I would just encourage um, the social distancing, um, take, take those safety precautions um, and that will help us out as well. And I, I would echo that as well, Kyle, that, that one of the most important things that all of our community businesses and um, uh, citizens can do is really follow the social distancing guidelines appropriately when they uh, frequent not only our facilities, but uh, the business and retail facilities in the area, uh, maintain that distance of six feet, uh, good hand hygiene, uh, wearing a mask and helping us by bringing masks into our facilities to help us with our PPE supplies. So when they come in, they, they bring their own masks. It's a key part of that. We, we also have a fund through St. Joseph's uh, Foundation that's called the COVID-19 Response Fund that they can contribute to to support our staff. And I, I think it's important to note that uh, we recognize that so many people in our communities have been affected by the economic downturn, uh, their businesses are suffering, their employees have been laid off, that these things aren't, uh, our businesses aren't immune to that. We've laid off a number of people who are put on, or also put them on special administrative leave that they and their families are as well suffering from the significant downturn in uh, their economic uh, 
of situation because of this. And I know that the Brainerd Lakes Area Community Foundation at the uh, communitygiving.org is also an opportunity for them to provide to some of the people in need in our, in our area, those that can provide that. Thanks. And that and that's a great transition into the next question. I just have two more questions here. And, I, you know, a story I don't think has been told enough or maybe understood enough is the financial impacts, like you mentioned, Dr. Henry, on the health care providers, especially in rural areas. You've been impacted as much or more than any small business or any business in our community. Uh, Matt from Lakeshore asks, what kind of financial hardship are the hospitals experiencing right now and how are you staying afloat? Uh, Kayla Rowan from East Coast Lake uh, wants to know about the layoffs and furloughs and, and, and your plans around that. Uh, Kyle, I think you were gonna lead on the financial impacts question. So let's start with you. Sure, and I, I think I would just uh, start off by saying we, we certainly appreciate the um, and empathize with the devastation that this is causing to not only our local economy, but state economy and, and even national economy. And um, unfortunately, the healthcare system, um, no pun intended, hasn't been immune to um, that downturn. And so what we have done, um, even before the governor announced it, we had uh, started limiting elective surgeries, um, radiology type procedures, uh, physical and occupational rehab. So we are looking at probably a 60 to 70% decrease in our um, revenue and uh, services. And um, the Minnesota Hospital Association has been collecting data from, from hospitals across the state and they are projecting um, that Minnesota hospitals in total are, will be losing about $3 billion a month. And so um, that, that's a challenge for us clearly. Um, we've, we've had to take the steps to what we call low need workers. If we're not doing surgery, we don't need uh, surgery staff. And, and uh, we are cross training some of those individuals or trying to find uh, places where we do have needs for them. And um, we're getting some uh, funding through the federal and state programs but it's, it's not coming anywhere near uh, close to the amount that, that we're actually um, uh, losing on a month to month basis. Dr. Henry or Tim, would you wanna uh, add some thoughts to, to what Kyle had mentioned there? I, I would agree. And I, the, the figure I had heard through the Minnesota Hospitalization, Hospital Association was that it was about, be about 3 billion over three months. So about a billion dollars a month that healthcare systems in the state of Minnesota are are losing uh, as a result of decreased revenue. And as Kyla has talked about, we have people on special administrative leave who have been furloughed, but we are uh, aware that many of these people may need to come back and immediately be put to work or repurposed or redeployed in areas of greatest need. So we have ongoing training like Kyla talked about to be able to put people back into the critical care in inpatient unit and make sure that they're adequately trained to do so and do so at a moment's notice so that we can actually meet the surge when it truly does come. Um, but uh, as he had said, we're seeing significant decreases in our, in our inpatient care and uh, emergency volumes, et cetera, that have uh, significantly impacted our financial statements. Uh, and uh, we recognize that we're not immune to it, as Kyle said, and every, uh, so many businesses in our state and our community have been affected in this manner. We do get some funding that we have uh, uh, applied for, but as Kyle said, it comes far short of meeting the, the needs that really put there and, and all healthcare systems in the state of Minnesota and the nation probably have been uh, impacted in a similar fashion. Mm -hmm. Tim, let's let's have you get the last get the last word in on that particular question about financial impacts. Yeah, I'm again we're doing the same thing, being financially impacted, and like all the others, we have to really work on adjusting our costs. Uh, how do we how do we we're putting in place uh, furloughs uh, and um, other options or ideas, um, but just managing expenses and try to balance that uh, is, is really a challenge. Um, I, I do think that the organizations in this central Minnesota area, uh, I feel well are well run. So I think that operationally helps us work our way through it. 
I, I don't think that's the same everywhere, but I think Central Minnesota has uh, a real reason to be proud about the operations. And I think those aspects itself will help us get through it. I think more of our concern is I think we will get through it. Um, just like, again, all other businesses going through this, we, we know we're not the only ones. But I think our biggest concern too is what happens after. We can get through this, but then how do we ensure that we can uh, make sure that we're continuing to be strong organizations to be able to continue to serve this area in the future. That's the other aspect that we're already thinking about going forward. If I might add just one other thing too, uh, you know, the way we do business has changed in a month and a half's time. And it's not going to, go, going to go back. And we're looking at what will the government, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, uh, private payers and insurers do. But we recognize that our ability to meet the patients where they need their care has changed dramatically. It's, uh, it's expedited the care of virtual care to where we had planned a couple pilots and a few clinics when we first started to have this, we were positioned pretty well to now doing, as I said before, 72,000 virtual visits in, in the last six weeks. And so we know that business as usual is, is not gonna be the same. And so we're trying to design what is the clinic of the future or the healthcare visit of the future uh, look like and, and how do we utilize the technology that and the learnings that we've experienced through this COVID-19 crisis to change how we deliver healthcare and, and meet people where they need where their needs are. Thank you. Uh, you know, this financial impacts question really dovetails nicely into the, um, the, uh, the, the economic question as far as reopening businesses in the state of Minnesota. I'm looking at my, my uh, clock here and in, in about seven minutes, Governor Walls is going to be making an announcement about reopening businesses in the state. Sounds like the stay at home order is going to be uh, extended to May 18th, but there might be uh, as I understand it, some provisions for curbside retail sales and things of that nature, but it's very slow and steady. And I just want to, uh, you know, just say full disclosure to everyone uh, that, that's on the webinar. Our chamber has been very active, very vocal about reopening our small businesses, our businesses, actually all of them, are as safely and as soon as possible, given the economic devastation that we have a front row seat to every single day. Um, Jackie from Baxter says uh, uh, want, he, she wants to know how you feel about businesses reopening under state guidelines. Uh, Melissa Rebelo, also from Baxter, what are your thoughts on the tourist season coming up? And then Amy Hendrickson from Brainerd mentioned seasonal cabin owners and, and those aspects. So I guess the open-ended question would be, how do you feel about business reopenings? How do you feel about the tourism season uh, from a healthcare perspective in the Brainerd Lakes area. And if I, if I remember correctly, Pete, you were going to take this one first. So um, we tried to stay out of the political arena as much as we can, although we know that there's been a lot of uh, this going on. I'm gonna leave the decision as to when the, the state kind of reopens retail business to uh, people like yourself in the chamber and uh, helping to hopefully assist the governor to move in the right direction. I think the key thing for us is we need to know what that will do to impact this uh, doubling time that we keep talking about because we recognize that the transition of people from more uh, widespread community spread of COVID-19 into our area which still has a relatively we believe a relatively low prevalence of COVID-19 can indeed impact that doubling time. Uh, we are have contingency plans in place so that we can meet those needs. So that was one of the questions I saw in the chat, chat that what will this influx of patients do? Uh, will it exceed our capacity? We do not believe it will. We think we're well positioned to meet that need. And then I think that just knowing uh, uh, that w as businesses open up, we have to continue to try to do an, uh, everything we can to continue to do the social distancing in those settings. Uh, as I see it, essential business like grocery stores and Costco and some other businesses continue to do that. And they've implemented a number of practices to help reduce the likelihood of spread. I think we can continue to do that in all of our retail and other businesses to the hope that we can get our economy back up and going. And and then continue to serve the patients that we need. And I hope that we have a little bit of time to just quickly touch on serology testing a little bit further because I think there's a lot of, I saw a lot of questions on the chat on that, Matt. Okay. We'll, we'll get into that, but we might have to do it in the, in the uh, 
the closing remarks and maybe that could be a little bit more of a potpourri. Uh, your perspectives on the reopening of businesses and tourism, uh, Tim and Kyle. I, I, this is, um, I don't think, you know, we're in a position to control when these decisions are made, but I think just from the standpoint, uh, a couple things, um, really agree with Dr. Henry. I know, we know our world is not gonna be the same. And, and actually it is exciting from that standpoint. Um, how are we going to be able to uh, provide healthcare in the future? What will that look like? Uh, so I, I think that's something we're up to the challenge. Um, but regardless of what occurs as far as what's opening, uh, we just gotta make sure that, that we can help businesses make sure they practice safe measures because people are gonna be looking at that and kind of Matt, you were bringing that up yesterday in a meeting and shared some great information, which I shared with uh, our chamber. Uh, the whole importance of how do we help everybody make sure that we're keeping uh, people safe and taking appropriate measures uh, regardless of when it opens and, and uh, how do we support each other uh, during that time. Thank you. Kyle. And I would just uh, echo uh, Pete and Tim. Um, we're certainly not going to be in the political um, arena of, of what businesses should or shouldn't open. Again, hopefully that's something that um, the business community and the governor and the legislature can come to some sort of agreement. Um, but any business that either reopens or is currently opening, um, again, just to make sure that appropriate steps have been taking, taken to um, protect their customers and, and their employees by practicing uh, good distancing, hand hygiene is, is, is a huge thing. And uh, as far as the tourism goes, um, I, I know I've heard there were a lot of boats that came up this weekend or last weekend. And so, um, you know, those, those folks are gonna be here and, and um, we, we're ready and willing to serve them um, as well as our local uh, permanent residents. All right, well, thank you. We covered a lot of ground. I, uh, I've been focusing in on my notes and your responses, and I have not as much uh, looked at the chat questions. Uh, Dr. Henry, I know you, you have. It's really tough to get all everything answered in an hour, but we, we did our best. I'm just gonna give you a chance, each of you a chance to make some closing remarks. If you wanna hit on any of those points, you certainly can, but. I do want to respect everybody's time and, and get done as closely to two o'clock as we can. So um, who would like to who would like to start us off here with just some closing comments? Well, I'll, I'll start. Mine is, mine is really short. Um, I just encourage everybody to have hope. Um, I think together we'll get through this. Um, and we just appreciate the opportunity to um, help answer some questions, but you can always count on all of us. If you have further questions, please contact us, but we appreciate the opportunity. And I would echo that and just uh, also want to thank the community. Um, I, I know this has been a tremendous hardship, um, but, but the steps that were taken really have helped uh, get us prepared for um, whatever may uh, present um, present to us in the, in the future. And so we are in uh, so much of a better place today than we were um, even two weeks ago. So uh, I would just, uh, again, um, thank the community for, for their support and, and uh, wish that everybody stays safe and, and healthy. Thank you. Dr. I would just, uh, again, thank, I'd like to thank the chamber and you, Matt, for this opportunity to bring information to our business leaders in our community. I thank the community for all the efforts and the collaboration that they've done. I'd like to thank the Kyle and Tim and their organizations for the excellent collaboration that's occurred in dealing with this pandemic. And uh, most importantly, I think as we've talked about, we're open for business, that it's safe to get care, that we hope people do uh, initially call and create a virtual visit and they can escalate that up as necessary to say, do you need to come in and see the ER? 
Do you need to get care through a, a face to face visit, et cetera? And then just very quickly on serology testing, I know there were questions on that. It's very important to understand that serology testing in this specific disease is in, in its infancy, that the test that we're using is actually one of the most accurate, that it shouldn't be done before 14 days from the day of the onset of illness. And people who have had a prior illness that they think was COVID and didn't meet criteria for testing at that time can get that test, but they need to have it ordered by a provider. And then most importantly, go to a reputable business. One of the three uh, facilities here that we do this for a living. This is what we, and how we do it. And we assure that the quality is where it should be. And uh, another question quickly about quarantine. Why quarantine for 14 days? Why don't I just get the serology test? The question is because the serology test can have a very high false negative rate, which means it can say that you didn't have it when you do. Once you get to that 14 days, the test becomes about 100% accurate. So if you've had symptoms and you're past that 14 days, you can do it. If you're a con uh, considered a possible plasma donor, it's an appropriate thing to do. Or if you have an immunocompromised situation or you're immune suppressed, then you can be a candidate to ensure that once you had symptoms that you've mounted an appropriate response. But it does not, and it's very important, it does not infer immunity to the disease. We do not know that yet. Uh, we know that people make antibodies, some more than others, some make blocking or neutralizing antibodies, but it's very important that people get not get a self, a, 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 this confidence that they are immune to it because they have antibodies. We don't know that yet, and we don't know how long those antibodies stay around and whether they truly protect you against future illness. So thank you. Well, thank you, gentlemen. On behalf of uh, the Brainerd Dispatch and the Brainerd Lakes Chamber, just wanted to, uh, uh, again, just say thank you for giving us some time today. Kyle Bauer, CEO of Cuyuna Regional Medical Center, uh, Dr. Pete Hendry, Chief Medical Officer for Essentia Health, and Tim Rice, President and CEO of Lakewood Health System. Uh, thank you so much. My message to everyone uh, that's, that's remaining here on the webinar is, uh, hey, we're all in this together, we're stronger together, and we're all working for the same things, which is the safety, well-being, and, and financial sustainability, economic prosperity of our areas so we can get through this thing together. So um, I wish you the best uh, as we head into uh, the rest of the afternoon of the weekend, and we'll see you around the Brainerd Lakes area soon. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.